after the fall of the Iron Curtain, many Russians made Aliyah in the land of Israel. And the story is told that this one fellow by the name of Vadim made Aliyah and he came to a kibbutz and he was a great worker, very involved, but he had one shortcoming. Every five minutes he would nudge one of his colleagues, what time is it, what time is it? Every five minutes, what time is it, what time is it, what time is it? And the guys were going a little crazy. So after 30 days they decided they're going to make a special party and they're going to buy Vadim a watch. So 30 days pass and they make a big party celebrating the first 30 days in the land of Israel. And uh, they award Vadim with this gift, the gift of a watch. So Vadim is all excited, he opens the package, says, what is this, a watch? What do I need a watch for? I have all of you, I don't need a watch. He said, you know, if you need to know the time, you look at the watch, nah, I don't need a watch, I have all you, you tell me the time all the time. So they're thinking a way to get him to use the watch. So one fellow says, you know, Vadim, you need a watch just in case you get up in the middle of the night and we're all asleep and you want to know what time it is, so you'll have a watch. He says, I don't need a watch, but how are you going to know what time it is in the middle of the night? He says, oh, for the middle of the night I have my chauffeur. He says, your chauffeur tells the time? He says, no, no, you don't understand. I get up in the middle of the night and I want to know what time it is. I open up the window and I blow the chauffeur very, very loud. And my neighbor wakes up and he says, Meshugane, it's three o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> Every holiday has a mitzvah. Sukkis is the mitzvah to sit in a sukkah, in a hut. Pesach, it's a mitzvah to eat matzah. What is the mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah? The mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah is the blowing of the shofar. As it says in Numbers 29.1, Uvachodesh hashvi be'echad lachodesh, yoyim terua yiyelechem. On the first day of the seventh month, which is the day of Rosh Hashanah, that is a day you shall sound the shofar, Yom Teruah. And as Maimonides, the Rambam, enumerates in his positive commandment, commandment 170, that we are commanded to listen to the sound of the shofar on the first day of Tishrei. But what is the reason why we blow the shofar? What is the message of the chauffeur? What is the chauffeur teaching us year after year? The Rambam answers this question in his magna opus in the Mishnah Torah under the laws of tshuva, under the laws of repentance, chapter 3, law number 4. And there the Rambam says, Afal pishet kia shofer b'rosh Hashanah even though the blowing of shofar on Rosh Hashanah is a decree from the Torah, in other words, it's a mitzvah, it's a mitzvah that has no reason. However, says the Rambam, Rem is a yesh boy. There is a hint of why we blow the shofar. And that is, Uru Yishenim Mishnaschem V'chizru B'teshuva. The Rambam says the reason is, that we blow the shofar so that those who are in a slumber should awake from their sleep and to return to God with tshuva, with repentance. So this is the definition according to the Rambam. 
of why we blow the shofar, for the shofar reminds us to return to God. However, the question may be asked, why does the Rambam mention this mitzvah in the laws of teshuva, in the laws of repentance? The Rambam should have mentioned this mitzvah or the reason of the mitzvah in the laws of shofar. Furthermore, the Gemara has another approach. The Gemara in the tract of Rosh Hashanah, page 16, side A, says, Imru lufanai malchiyos, kadei shetam luchuni aleichem, ubameh b'shoifer. The Gemara says, on the day of Rosh Hashanah, say before me words of kingship, so that you accept my kingship upon you, and I shall rule upon you. And how do you do this? With the blowing of the shofar. In other words, according to the Gemara, the reason why we sound the shofar on Rosh Hashanah is because on Rosh Hashanah we coronate God as king of the universe. And when you coronate a king, you blow the trumpets. And here too we blow the shofar to coronate God as king. So what is the real answer? Is it tshuva? Is it a mitzvah? Or is it coronation? And in truth, they are all correct. And there are three levels to the blowing of the shofar. The first level is that the mitzvah of shofar is a mitzvah. In other words, it's a mitzvah to blow shofar. Why? Because shofar reminds us that we resolve on this day to accept upon ourselves mitzvahs, that we are going to follow the mitzvahs of the Torah. And therefore, the shofar is the inspiration to follow the mitzvahs. And that's why there's a custom that every year Rosh Hashanah, we accept upon ourselves a new hidur, a new nuance to the mitzvah to add one detail to the mitzvah, or a new mitzvah that you never did before. Every year we get a year older, a year smarter, and therefore a year more committed. And on Rosh Hashanah, it's customary to accept upon yourself a new mitzvah, or a new detail of a mitzvah. The second level of the blowing of the shofar is tshuva. Tshuva, repentance, is higher than a mitzvah. The fact that tshuva can forgive for violating a mitzvah implies that it comes from a higher source than the mitzvah itself. And that's why the Rambam, in the laws of tshuva, talks about the blowing of the shofar, and he says that this is a remez, it's a hint. What's a hint? A hint is something that you cannot articulate, you cannot verbalize. You cannot put it into words. It's too discreet. It's too concealed. Tshuva is so great. Tshuva is so holy, you cannot really talk about it. You just got to do it. So therefore, the Ramam says, there's a remez. It's a hint. Why we blow shofar? The hint is that we do tshuva. Which also explains another interesting detail. And that is that the Rambam, Maimonides, when he enumerates the 613 commandments of the Torah, he does not enumerate the mitzvah of tshuva. He does not put the mitzvah of tshuva as one of the 613, because it's not confined to one mitzvah. It's a lot larger than one mitzvah. It has the ability to forgive for violating all the other mitzvahs. And then you have the third level, an even higher level. And that is through the blowing of the shofar, we coronate God as king. And that means bitul atzmi. That is to surrender oneself to God. That you surrender your will to God's will. And your desires to God's desires. That is the meaning of coronating God as king. And this, the Rambam does not mention whatsoever. 
because it's higher than a rem is. It's even higher than a hint. And therefore the Rambam in the book of Halachos, in his work on law, does not enumerate this detail and this definition of blowing shofar, the definition of coronating God as king. And this we can understand through a parable that the Baal Shem Tov gives pertaining to the blowing of the shofar. The Baal Shem Tov tells us that there was a king and the king had an only child. And this only child was very beloved by the king. And the king hired the best tutors and teachers. And this child was very gifted and very smart and brilliant and was able to play music and he was able to paint pictures and he was able to to fight and, and to play and do everything that was needed. He was complete. But yet the king wanted him to grow and to advance even to the next level. So the king decided to send him to a foreign country and to give him money and servants and guards to protect him. And there he would go to foreign countries and he would learn from their cultures and learn from their ways and therefore he would become more intelligent and enhance his already gifted mind. What happened was that uh, going to these foreign countries, he went further and further. And he began to follow the desires and the passions of his heart. And he began to spend his money negligently. And sooner than later, all his money was gone. He had no more money to pay his guards and his servants, and he was alone. And finally, he decided it's time to come home. So he returns, and he's walking, and he's walking, and finally, he comes back to his country. He comes to the border, and they don't know who he is. He has old, torn, and tattered clothing, and he even forgot the language of the country. Becoming familiar with all the other countries and the languages of the other countries, he forgot his own language. And therefore, there's no way for him to come back into his country. So what does he do? He begins to mime. He begins to express himself in a pantomime. And he makes gestures with his body. And he's trying to explain that he's the son of the king, but they're laughing at him. This guy's crazy. What is he talking about? And he starts to cry. After he cannot express himself anymore, he begins to cry. And the king hears the cry of his son. He remembers the voice. And this awakens the love of the father to his son, and the father hugs his son and kisses his son. This is the parable of the Baal Shem Tov. He goes on to say that the same is true with the neshama, the soul of every Jew. That God takes our soul and sends our soul down to a foreign country, down to this physical world. And the purpose of the soul coming down to the world is to have challenges and to overcome these challenges. And with overcoming these challenges, the soul rises to a much higher place. Unfortunately, many of us forget why we're here. We forget our mission. And the soul begins to follow his desires. And it becomes tarnished. And it becomes dirty. And it becomes poverty stricken. It even forgets the Maimaloshan. It even forgets the Maimaloshan. If he gets his mother's tongue, the mother tongue, the mother language, he can't talk Yiddish anymore. He can't talk Hebrew anymore. The sitter is foreign. The synagogue becomes foreign. And finally, on Rosh Hashanah, he realizes, I have to come home. It's time to come home. But he comes into the shul, and then he opens the, sh the sitter. He doesn't know how to hold it, upside down, inside out. What page are we on? Do we sit up? Do we stand up? Do we sit down? Totally confused. And finally, the soul begins to cry. 
But it's not a simple cry. It's really a silent cry. It's a silent cry from the inner chambers of the heart. And this silent cry from the inner chambers of the heart is the meaning of the blowing of the shofar. When we blow the shofar, the shofar represents this silent cry that every Jew feels on this day of Rosh Hashanah. Every Jew wants to come back home. Every Jew wants to coronate God as king. And so we regret what we did. And we ask God once again to take us back home. And we vow that we are going to hearken to his word and we are going to follow what he wants. So this is the third level of the blowing of the shofar that coronates God as our king and therefore we accept God's yoke upon us. There's another interpretation and that of the Tzemach Tzedek. The Tzemach Tzedek says that the blowing of the shofar represents ta'anug, represents the awakening of divine pleasure. What does that mean? We know that on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, Almighty God metaphorically ascends from this world. He leaves the world. Why does he leave the world? He sees all of this terrorism. He sees all of the violence. He sees all the unethical acts that are being perpetrated. And he becomes disgusted with the world. Why do I need it? What do I need to be king over these people for? And so God ascends. He takes a vacation. Comes Rosh Hashanah morning, and we blow the shofar. By blowing the shofar, we awaken a tainug, a pleasure within God to be king of the universe. And we show God how this will bring you divine pleasure. And when God feels this divine pleasure, he comes down to the world ever greater and ever stronger and ever more powerful and inculcates into the world a greater energy than ever before. That is what happens every year at Rosh Hashanah when we blow the shofar. The question is, however, what happens when Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos? When Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, the Mishnah tells us in the tract of Rosh Hashanah at the very beginning of chapter number 5 that when Rosh Hashanah falls out on the Shabbos, we do not blow the shofar. However, we do blow the shofar only in the Beis HaMikdash, in the Temple. What's the meaning of this? says the Tzemach Tzedek that we know Shabbos, the day of Shabbos, is called pleasure. V'karasha l'Shabbos oinig. And God called the Shabbos the day of pleasure. And therefore, when Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, Shabbos itself creates that pleasure in God. We don't need to blow the shofar. Shabbos fulfills that void that we would normally fulfill when we blow the shofar. And therefore, we don't blow the shofar when it falls out on the Shabbos. However, in the temple, they did blow the shofar. Why? Because when it comes to pleasure, there are many levels. The lowest level of pleasure we accomplish through Shabbos. But in the temple, they were able to elicit a greater dimension, a greater level of pleasure. And therefore, in the base of Migdash, in the Holy Temple, they blew the shofar even when it fell out on the Shabbos. And in truth, says the Tzemach Tzedek, there are six levels to pleasure. Six levels to the blowing of the shofar. A Rosh Hashanah that falls out during the week when we blow the shofar. A Rosh Hashanah that falls out on Shabbos and we blow the shofar in the Holy Temple. That's a greater pleasure. And the blowing of the shofar in the first holy temple was even greater than the second holy temple. And then there's a greater level of pleasure that is elicited when in the first holy temple 
the Jubilee year came, and on Yom Kippur, they blew the shofar. So this is four levels. Then there's a fifth level of the blowing of the shofar, and that was at Matan Torah, when the Torah was given. It says when the Torah was given, God blew the shofar. That's even a higher level. And then there's a sixth level. And that is, It shall be when the great day will come, when Mashiach will come, that God himself will blow the great shofar, the shofar gadol, the big shofar, the great shofar. And those Jews that were lost in Assyria, and the Jews that were crushed in the land of Egypt, which both are a metaphor for Assyria represents riches and Egypt represents poverty. One who has poverty is crushed and therefore he cannot serve God. And one who is so rich doesn't need God, he gets lost. And therefore this great chauffeur will bring back those Jews as well. And will come and bow down before God in Jerusalem. So these are the six levels of shofar that we blow on Rosh Hashanah. We start with the first, but hopefully we ascend even to the sixth level. And this is also hinted in uh, the teachings of Pirkei Rabbi, the Rabbi Elazar that he explains over there that when Isaac was about to be slaughtered and then the angel told Abraham, don't touch your son Isaac. All of a sudden, Abraham saw a ram that got stuck in the thicket. And he took that ram and he slaughtered it and said, God, take this ram in the place of my son Isaac. That ram had two chauffeurs. It says, God took those two chauffeurs and he used the left chauffeur to blow on Mount Sinai when he gave the Torah. And the second chauffeur, the right chauffeur, he awaits for the coming of Mashiach to blow that chauffeur to bring in all of the exiles. And therefore, by blowing the chauffeur on Rosh Hashanah, we create this pleasure within God. And so chauffeur represents not only a day of judgment, but chauffeur also represents a day of true divine pleasure between God and his creatures and his creations. But ultimately, when we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, we await the final blow. When God will take the shofar God of this big shofar and call in all the exiles from all four corners of the world. They tell a story that the rabbi of Munkach would blow the shofar every morning as it is customary throughout the month of Elul. For the month before Rosh Hashanah, the month of Tshuva, is a month that we are supposed to awaken and return and fix all the mistakes of the past year. And therefore, to help us and to remind us to do this, we blow the shofar every morning after davening, after shachris. There are those who blow it by mincha also. So they tell the story that the rabbi of Munkach, the Mincha Salazar, every morning would blow the shofar. Now he had a grandson by the name of Herschelah. And Herschelah was very close to his Zaydi, to his grandpa. And after his Zaydi, the Munkacha would blow the shofar. He would say, Zaydi, Zaydi, blow it one more time. So after he went through the entire cycle of blows, he blew it one more time. And this happened every day. The morning of Rosh Hashanah, before the blowing of the shofar, the Mincha Salazar, the Holy Rebbe of Munkach, opens up the ark. 
and he falls to his feet and he puts his head into the Torah's and he says, God, forgive me, for I have sinned. The entire shoe was watching. The Holy Rebbe sinned. He's a sinner. If he's a sinner, forget it. We have no chance. We totally forget about it. And the Rebbe is saying, God, forgive me if I have sinned. What's the sin of the Minchas Allah? What did he do? He says, God, I have sinned. <clears throat> I have violated your law in the code of Jewish law. In the Shulchan Aruch, in the code of Jewish law, it says that the morning before Rosh Hashanah, we do not blow the shofar. And the basic reason is to make a distinction between the days of Elul, which is only a minhag, a custom, and the actual day of Rosh Hashanah itself, that is a mitzvah, a commandment from God. It says in the Code of Jewish Law, we don't blow the shofar. But God, I'm sorry, I blew the shofar. I have violated your Torah. I have sinned. I ask for forgiveness. But God, you know it wasn't my fault. It was Herschel's fault. It was my grandson's fault. Herschel turned to me and said, Zaidi, blow the shofar. I said, Herschel, we don't blow the shofar today. It's Erev Rosh Hashanah. He says, Zaidi, please, just blow the shofar one time. I said, Herschel, I, I can't do it. You're not allowed to. You're not supposed to. It says, he says, no, Zaidi, please, Zaidi, blow the shofar just once. I was looking into the sincerity of my grandson's eyes. I saw the tears rolling down his cheeks. I saw the warmth of his heart. I saw the sincerity of his voice. How could I not pick up the chauffeur and blow the chauffeur? And so I picked up the chauffeur, God, and I blew the chauffeur. Erev Rosh Hashanah. God, today is the day of judgment. And you look around and you see your children. And you say, you know, this one made that sin, and the other one did the other sin, and the other child sinned over here. And therefore, maybe we don't deserve the blowing of the shofar. But you know what? Your children are asking from the depths of their heart, Almighty God, Tata and Himmel, Father in Heaven, Zaidi, blow the shofar just once. Zaidi, blow the shofar one more time. And so said the Munkacha, Almighty God, I ask you, pick up the shofar, pick up that big shofar, and blow the shofar that will herald in the exiles.